Good morning, good afternoon and good evening. A warm welcome to all of you from around the world. Welcome to this webinar on the use of Earth observation data and geospatial technology to support decision making in local municipality areas provided by the South African National Space Agency. My name is Xin Yi and I'm from the United Nations Office for Outer Space Affairs and it is my pleasure to be the moderator today. Before we begin, here are a few administrative announcements. First, please switch off your cameras and keep your microphones muted throughout the webinar. Second, please type your questions and comments in the chat. You may do this at any point during the webinar. My colleague Rodrigo will be monitoring the chat. We will attempt to answer as many questions as possible during the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. Lastly, this webinar is being recorded. The recording will be available on the USA YouTube channel after the event. Now, without further ado, let me welcome our trainer from SENSA, Nali Mudal. Nali, over to you, please. Good morning, good day, everyone. Um, let me just share the screen. Uh, yes, as per introduction, my name is Ngarizani Mudau, and a very warm welcome to our training workshop, which will be focusing on the use of earth, earth observation data and geospatial technology to support decision making in local municipality areas. I'm sure you have seen the program. Um, so we have two two hour sessions. One will focus on introduction to remote sensing and also the applications um, of remote sensing in local municipality areas. And then the second session, which will be after lunch, will focus on the practical applications. Uh, so it will give the participants an opportunity to visualize the data, analyze the data, among other functions. So we'll begin. So uh, maybe before we start, why focus on local municipality areas? Um, so we can maybe look at the definition. So a local municipality is an administrative unit that provides general government, government of, or government of a specific population in a defined area. In South Africa, local municipalities are responsible for managing a number of um, uh, services or providing a number of services, including water and sanitation, and emergency services, environmental regulatory services, waste management, health services, land use management, amongst other. Local municipalities are also core in the implementation of strategies to address and respond to climate change, both mitigation and um, adaptation. Earth observation uh, data and geospatial technologies provide the capability to map and monitor human settlement, um, I mean, human activity and also the environment, which are key in uh, achieving sustainable uh, um, development uh, goals. So different terms may be used uh, to describe what is local municipality, depending on where you are, but the content of this training should be relevant, whether you are from the government department, public entity, or also just um, someone who's interested in learning the application of geospatial technologies to support decision making. So before we start with the, the training, allow me to introduce our organization. Uh, we are a public entity under the Department of Science and Innovation. And our mandate is to provide uh, for the promotion and use of space and cooperation in space related activities, foster research in space science, advanced scientific engineering through human capital, support the creation of an environment conducive to industrial development in space technologies within the framework of a government policy. So uh, we have four programs at, at SANSA. One, it's space. Um, engineering, which focuses on the development of space instruments, including satellites, uh, space operations. Uh, this is where we have the ground infrastructure to receive uh, satellite images. We also offer a number of services, including launch support, in-orbiting testing, 
emergency support. Uh, we also host uh, infrastructure for other international partners or organization. We also have Space Science, um, which is uh, located in Western Cape in South Africa, uh, in Hermanas, where we do geospace observation, space physics, space weather, and electromagnetic technologies. And uh, last but not least, we have Earth Observation, which is where we come from. And this is uh, the directorate where we do image acquisition, processing, archiving, and also disseminate uh, dissemination. We also coordinate development of value-added products and, and services. So this is to show our coverage in terms of the area that we are able to cover from low Earth orbit satellites as they pass over our ground station. So we are able to acquire images from just below the equator coming down to the southern part. So of course we need to have agreements or some arrangements with the uh, satellite custodians uh, to allow us to access the data as the satellites pass over our areas. So if we look at the data that we currently receive, uh, this is um, the data that we receive directly from the our grant station, which is located in Harte Base Hook uh, in South Africa. So we download directly data from Landsat 8 and 9, CBUS 4A and 4B. We also have a grant uh, infrastructure to receive spot and also MODIS, MODIS Aqua and Terra sensors. So in addition to the data that we have or that we directly receive from the ground station, uh, we also have an archive of um, imagery uh, which dates back to 1972. So this imagery is uh, acquired from Landsat, Sport, CBUS, and all the other sensors that are listed there, including Sumbandera Set which is our first gov uh, government funded satellite. So the table shows the uh, characteristics or specification of the sensors that we have access to from spatial resolution coverage and also date of acquisition. So this imagery or archive imagery is important if we want to look back and analyze you know, the human activity, historical uh, land use, and also changes in the environment so that we can prepare uh, better for, for the future. Um, so we also have um, an archive of spot imagery, which we've been acquiring at a national level from 2006 mm -hmm. until 2017. So this uh, imagery was acquired using single uh, license multi government, uh, multi-use government uh, license, which allow us to uh, acquire imagery on behalf of government users, process it, and once it's done, then we are able to disseminate to all um, government users, including research institutions um, and also academic um, institutions. So this, this is one of the projects that we initiated to promote the use of um, Earth observation data, especially at low at a local municipality or district area, since it provides access to uh, high resolution images from 2.5 meter to 1.5 uh, meter. Uh, so uh, the imagery is available to all government end use and also for uh, research purposes. So you can just imagine the wealth of information that can be derived from this data, which was uh, acquired using the same sensor, uh, more or less the same in um, uh, environmental condition. So I'll hand over to uh, my colleague, um, Thomas, who will give the introduction to remote sensing and GIS. Thank you. Uh, uh, good morning, everyone. Good afternoon and good evening, uh, people from across the world. Uh, as they introduced me, I'm Lisiba Zueling, a remote sensing scientist here at SANSA. What I'll be doing, I'll be taking you through uh, remote sensing and geographical information system. As we know, the two, two, the two uh, <coughs> Tools is what we use to monitor the Earth and as well as uh, to 
provide decision support system for local government. So basically what is remote sensing? Uh, remote sensing is the science of acquiring information about an object without being in direct contact with that particular object. Uh, what I'm doing now, looking at my screen, uh, as a human being, I'm using my five senses. In this, in this case, I'm using the sense of sight. I'm able to visualize features on the screen, meaning that I'm remotely sensing uh, uh, the letters which are on my screen. The same thing as in when you are watching the presentation, you are doing what we call remote sensing. So the term is commonly used to refer to acquisition of information on object on about object on Earth from a raised platform. A race platform can be a drone, can be a satellite or an airplane. So, but uh, in general terms, it's defined as the practice of deriving information about the earth land, water, atmosphere using images acquired from overhead perspective using electromagnetic radiation in one or more regions of the electromagnetic spectrum. So, and a GIS, a GIS uh, basically it talks about how then do we store location and as well as attribute information uh, related to that particular uh, location. So it is defined as a system designed to capture, store, manipulate, analyze, manage, and present spatial or geographic data. So a GIS system usually deals with all types of geographical reference spatial and also as non-reference as spatial data, let's say population growth. If you want to measure the number of people or the number of uh, students, in a particular school, that information will refer to as a, as a special data. So uh, usually GIS use advanced tools to explore special relationships, patterns, and process of a uh, demographic and the economy at large. Basically there, when you talk about tools, we talk about decision support tools, as we know, uh, you can look at your Google Earth as one of your decision support tools. It helps people. Let's say I'm lost and I need to know about the distance of a particular area, and then I will tap into that uh, GPS and then it will give me direction. Those are the kind of decision support tools that we get from the integration of remote sensing and, and GIS. Usually uh, GIS, there are various components of a GIS. Uh, which is data. Data is, uh, it can be spatial, it can be vector or raster. Hardware, hardware, those are the computers that we use. Software, software, the GIS uh, softwares that we use to process the data. And then people, people can be, end users can be expect in the field in terms of those who are used to processing data and uh, making or assisting in terms of making informed decision. So that is an example of vector and raster data. So in terms of vector, you will have your points and then the points can be representation of various features. It can be, let's say, I want to look at the distribution of schools in a, in a map. So you will try and represent such features in a point form. And then uh, let's say I want to look at a river and then a river you will try to represent it in a form of a line. And a polygon, a polygon it depends on your aspects. Let's say I want to look at crop fields and I want to measure a phenology and so forth, then you will try to uh, represent those features as a polygon. And then usually a polygon uses X and Y coordinates uh, in terms of representation of information. And then a raster usually use grid cells uh, to represent information where it uses zeros and ones. And then the black dots that you see there, uh, those black dots that you see there, they are representing information in terms of uh, uh, location as well as uh, and then continued uh, analysis of remote sensing data together with geographical information data are called geospatial data, meaning that when you are integrating other data sets that includes can be your uh, crime statistics in an area, the number of people in an area, uh, uh, how settlements are increasing over time. You add that data set together, then you get your spatial data. 
And then uh, usually JS is used for analysis of your spatial data with non spatial data, which I referred to you earlier as uh, the number of people in an area. Uh, so this data is used to produce good quantitative and qualitative results to assist in informed decision making. So data collection in this case in, in, in GIS is in the form of digitizing surveys where people go out into the field and collect data using GPS. And then data management, that is where then you collect that data set and try to store it in a data system where you are able to access it without going uh, into the field. And then when you do data analysis, it means that you'll be able to uh, query the data wherever you have stored uh, the data in a, your database for any uh, server that you, uh, is used to store a JS data. So in remote sensing, uh, this is one of the process of uh, data capturing. Uh, we have the energy source. The energy source is what provides uh, the energy, and then it radiates, it propagates the surface, and then we propagate the surface. In the middle there at B, this interaction with the atmosphere, there are this water vapor, there are dust, there are other particles in the atmosphere. Some of the energy is absorbed and some of it is reflected, and some of it is redirected back into Earth, where now it starts to interact with various objects on the surface. And then from that, from those, uh, from that interaction, remember that uh, various uh, features or objects on Earth, uh, buildings, water bodies, vegetation, they have different spectral reflectance curve. So they reflect the energy back into the atmosphere, where it is also getting to intercepted by water vapor, uh, atmospheric constituents in the atmosphere. And then it is recorded by a satellite. And then remember the satellite record data using various sensors. And then from there, the data is transmitted to our ground station, where then we receive the data. Uh, my colleague Nale Elia showed you the coverage which we cover uh, as a space agency, meaning that most of the satellite providers, whenever they get within that range, mm -hmm. uh, usually we do direct reception of the data from there. Uh, the data is stored in our servers. That is why uh, our servers. And then from there, we start uh, accessing the data. And then in this case, from globally, you have various platforms where you can access data. You have your USGS, your ESA, and there are many uh, uh, various platforms where you can access data. So basically, uh, information uh, in remote sensing is collected into a formation. Uh, the first one, we call it passive uh, type of remote sensing. Uh, passive type of remote sensing, it relies on the availability of the sun for it to record information about the surface of, um, I mean, about surface objects. So on the first picture there, you see that the sun, which is the source is available, it radiates the earth and then there's a recording. And then we have another uh, type of remote sensing system, which we call it an active remote sensing. An active remote sensing, usually it sends its own beam, and then from then the energy gets uh, uh, intercepted with various surface features and it gets re reflected back into uh, the outer space. Basically with these two systems, uh, the passive sense I can say to you is like a, 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 when you are taking a picture during the day, so you rely on the sun for you to take a picture and then an active type of remote sensing, when you are in the dark and you try to use your cell phone to take a picture, it will send out a beam and then that is what uh, usually the phone captures is the more similar type of system. So there are various platforms which uh, are used, which cameras are embedded on those uh, platforms. We have satellite data, satellite data, usually these platforms are the ones which are orbiting the Earth in the outer space, and then there are various orbital plane. We have the low Earth orbiting, the middle, the middle Earth, and the geostationary orbital satellites. So this group of satellites is the one that we use to capture uh, remote sensing data and other uh, data sets. And then we have ground-based uh, sensors if you have your spectrometer, you go to the field and you try to take, to take spectral signatures. Uh, if uh, there's a vehicle which is taking photos in the in, in, 
in the field as well. That is one of uh, the platforms that is used. And then we have your unmanned aerial vehicles. Uh, those ones are your drones, uh, which is the current uh, technological advancement. So what is the major source for all that processes? Uh, everything that is happening in remote sensing, it relies on the electromagnetic radiation, which ranges from the X-rays to the long wave uh, radiation. Usually we as humans, we can only visualize the visible portion of the spectrum. And then uh, all the other waves, your infrared and microwaves uh, is usually what is kept, what we capture in remote sensing. For an example, uh, within the visible portion, uh, there are various satellites which uh, are specifically designed to capture certain information from the visible spectrum to the infrared region. And then the microwave region, usually that is where you find your active sensors. Usually most of the passive sensors, they capture information from the visible spectrum and up to a certain portion within the microwave. So, uh, what are the some of the disadvantages of remote sensing uh, technology is that sometimes the satellites themselves to build them is expensive and then their lifetime sometimes is not uh, to that extent so you have to keep on launching new satellite over time so and then the other uh, factor it might be that um, with the current advancement of your nano satellites, I think the technology is becoming affordable in most uh, states. So resolutions, resolution basically tells us about the information that a, a sensor is able to capture. And then whenever a sensor or a satellite is developed, uh, these are the specifications which we usually look at, the spatial, spectral, and the temporal resolution. I will start with the spatial. Uh, the spatial resolution usually tells us about the size of the pixel, uh, how much uh, a particular satellite is able to capture, uh, looking at the instantaneous field of view. So basically, let's say uh, it did a, a one meter spatial resolution, that one will be able to give you more information compared to a uh, 500 meter spatial resolution, meaning that the finer the spatial resolution, uh, the higher the resolution. And then that's an example of a spatial resolution. If you look at a 500 meter spatial resolution compared to a 30 meter there, you just see pixels, meaning that if you, pay, if you measure from one crest to another, you'll be able to uh, check out the number if the spatial resolution is really uh, 500 meters. You can see the other part. This is an example of a lens set imager, which is 30 meters. You are able to start visualizing some certain features. And then if you zoom further uh, using a finer spatial resolution, this one is an example of spot six, which is 1.5 meters. You are able to now start visualizing uh, individual structures, vegetation, and as well as you can tell some of the buildings if you know the area. And then spectral resolution, it tells you about the uh, different spectral bands. From the electromagnetic spectrum, we have the visible portion. So from there, we look at how many bands a particular sensor is able to capture. Uh, for an example, uh, within the visible portion, which ranges from 0 0.7, 0 0.4 to 0 0.7 micrometers. You find that there are finer bands in terms that are divided into one, band one, band two, band three, band four. And then that tells you about the spectral resolution. And then within the infrared region as well, you have the near infrared, the middle infrared, and the far infrared, which also uh, is uh, an example of spectral resolution. So uh, it tells you about the number of spectral bands in which a sensor collects reflect, reflected radiance. A panchromatic band, which is a longer a, a, a wave, usually you find that it captures the whole spectrum within the visible portion. You find that it captures from the blue to the red 
from 0 0.4 micrometers to 7 uh, micrometers. Usually, uh, this information you find that is the one that is used to enhance the resolution of other sensors because of usually a panchromatic band is always having a higher resolution and than the other uh, spectral uh, bands. So this is an example of a panchromatic image. You find that this one usually is represented in black and white and a multispectral image. This is when the different individual bands are separate and then are stuck together to uh, form one image. Then it starts indicating various colors to you. This is an example of spectral bands, how it is represented. It's usually represented in that energy range. It ranges from, uh, for an example, the panchromatic band ranges from 0 0.4 micrometers to 0 0.7 micrometers, or 450 nanometers to 7 60 nanometers, that is an example of spectral versus spatial resolution. And then temporal resolution, it tells you about the revisit period, how long it takes for one sensor to revisit a, a single area. If you are taking a picture over uh, South Africa, let's say the innovation hub, how long will it take for that particular sensor to visit that specific point over South Africa? So that is the temporal resolution. So radiometric resolution, it tells you about the level of uh, gray level values that a particular sensor is able to capture. For an example, uh, the picture on my bottom, on my top left, it, it is indicating a picture that is captured. For an example, using a two bit system, you can see that the level of gray values is not that uh, clear as compared to a picture where you find that it's an A-bit system where it is able to acquire a higher number of uh, gray level values, meaning that there's more energy captured by that particular sensor. So advantages of satellite remote sensing is that you are able, instead of going to the field trying to capture data, you are able to just capture a, a single area at a go. Uh, resolutions, uh, depending on application. Remember that the resolutions, you find that if you are going to look at global uh, uh, analysis, you find that a, a higher, uh, a lower spatial resolution sensor is more suitable for that particular application. Uh, and then those are the various applications in remote sensing. And then these are the, some of the GIS and remote sensing softwares that you use, and then those are the useful ones. Thank you. Uh, good morning, uh, good day, uh, good evening to everyone. Uh, my name is Nosiseko Mashi. I'm a remote sensing scientist. Uh, from South African National Space Agency. Uh, I'm going to be presenting on the remote sensing applications on agriculture, biodiversity, and water resource management. I know that we're supposed to start with um, human settlements and disaster management, uh, but we had to switch. Uh, as we know that food and water are the most important uh, things that we need for, to survive. So basically, um, as my colleague uh, Thomas introduced you to remote sensing uh, in terms of the electromagnetic spectrum, so uh, vegetation, like I said that I'm going to be focusing on agriculture, so basically my focus is on vegetation. Uh, as we know that we, when we see vegetation, we see vegetation is green uh, because uh, vegetation uh, uh, reflects uh, green uh, in the in the visible spectrum, and it absorbs uh, red and, uh, and 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 blue. This this uh, is caused by uh, the type of a plant. This is, in fact, the 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 the, the signature that you are looking at depends on the type of a plant. It depends on the structure of a leaf. Uh, uh, and it also depends on the canopy as well. So as you can see here, 
uh, we have different uh, types of vegetation that are shown. For instance, the green, that is the grass you see, uh, that it has a higher reflectance on the on the near infrared, and also you see the the tree, you see the the, the dry grass which has a lower reflectance on the on the near near infrared. So basically, uh, that is what we we use to actually differentiate between uh, vegetation types. So. Um, if, if and you are looking at a satellite image, you can visualize it uh, in different ways. We, we have what you call uh, the true color composites. We have what you call the false color composites. Uh, like I said, that when we see vegetation, you see it as green. So when we are doing these color composites, uh, whatever band that we allocate to green, whether it's red or blue, the vegetation will appear in that color. For instance, in the in the can I see the with the pointer? This one, okay, yeah. So this one where I'm pointing, that is, this is what we call the true color composite. So whereby vegetation is green, by soil is brown, like the normal colors that you see. And then we have the last two are basically the false color composites. You can see that the vegetation is red uh, in the, in this case. So that's basically what 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 we do to actually enhance the image so that we can identify the the feature that you were we are looking at in this case, which is vegetation. So uh, basically, uh, we can use re uh, remote sensing to uh, estimate the height of vegetation, the plant vigor, the water and nutrient st stress, which is the vegetation condition, the bio biomass and, and carbon content, and also we identify different species like I showed you earlier. So in this case, I'm just showing you a pre uh, an example of um, an, NDVI, an NDVI image, uh, which we mapped uh, in 2015 during the, 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 the drought season. So this changes, this shows the changes in vegetation condition uh, from, from, I think from January to October in 2015, which is basically a very important information for uh, decision makers, especially at municipality level, because for instance, if they, 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 they will be able to know if, uh, for instance, the, the, the grasslands or pastures are affected so that they are able to prepare in terms of uh, what to provide, whether they need to provide fodder or they need to provide some financial uh, relief. So uh, what we see here is the brown is basically the, the unhealthy vegetation or basalts, and then the green is basically the, uh, the, the, the healthy vegetation. So we also do what we call cropped arable land mapping, which is basically uh, mapping what is planted and what is not planted. So what you see here uh, is, is the red is basically what is not planted and the tiny bits of green is basically what is planted. So what happens is this is this information is very important for the municipality because it's kind of it's sort of an indicator in terms of where the food security is standing. It sort of indicates where the yield is going to be like at the end of the of the season, so that the government uh, or the municipality can 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 plan properly. And also, this kind of information is also useful uh, to the funding institutions like the banks, uh, so that they can see if there's going to be having any kind of return on investment by the end of the season, because they can see if whoever they funded has planted or they have not planted. And also it's useful for the insurance companies uh, so that when for, for the verific verification of claims, for instance, in the case where uh, there's, there are disasters like floods, uh, they, they can then uh, verify if then the, the 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 farmer who claims that they've lost uh, 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 crops due to to floods or, or drought or whatever they really had planted at the beginning of the season. So this is just to show you um, the, the 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 planted and fallow areas in one of the district one of the districts in in Limpopo province in South Africa. Uh, this is these are just the the summer and winter seasons from 2020 to 2022. So the blue is basically uh, the fallow and the orange is 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 uh, what is planted. The same here uh, is a similar thing. So basically, uh, it shows we can also give you the exact hectares in terms of what is planted and what is not planted. So uh, then moving to the crop growth. So also we can use remote sensing to monitor um, the the crop growth throughout the growing season. So we monitor how the, the, the crops are progressing using various indices and biophysical parameters. Also uh, monitoring the crop condition, that is the stress of, of the crops. 
uh, um, due to various things that like uh, hail, pests, diseases, uh, water and nutrient deficiency, etc. So basically here, if you look at where I'm pointing, uh, we have uh, uh, the green part and the yellow, uh, the yellow part and the and the and the red part. Basically, the green part is showing uh, the healthy vegetation. The yellow part is showing we call it an anomaly. So that's basically where the issue is. So that actually requires a farmer to actually go and have a look on the farm to see what is happening. So the, the red part is fallow. So basically, if you look at the at the where I'm pointing and where the arrow is, so this area is basically this because we went to the field and then we checked. So this is what this this stress based was damaged due to uh, application of a lot of fertilizer. So we can also look, uh, monitor the the growth as I showed in the previous slide whether the 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 the, the crops are growing steadily or they are stressed, and then you you know what to do as a as a farmer. And then, for instance, just to show you or to explain how the, 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 the analysis is done. Uh, so uh, to look at the nutrient deficiency, for instance, uh, we look at the chlorophyll and we look at the air, uh, leaf area index, that is the, the, the surface area that is covered by the leaves or the canopy. So if you look at the bottom, this, this uh, field in particular, so you can see that this, there's a full leaf area index, but if you look here, you can see that the chlorophyll is actually less. So that means uh, that particular that particular field at that point uh, requires some kind of fertilizer to be applied. And then here as well, if you look at this, uh, we're looking at the canopy water. Uh, you can see that there's less water uh, and you can look at this, you see that the, the, the field is actually uh, covered. The canopy is full, but there's 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 uh, less water canopy. That means it requires uh, uh, irrigation. So that's the kind of information that uh, we can retrieve from, from satellite images. So and also looking at the browsing and, and, and grazing capacity um, resources uh, using remote sensing. Uh, as you can see here, the, the, the dark green, that is the browsing resources, and the, the light green are actually the, uh, the, the, the grazing resources. And also you look at the uh, rangeland health, uh, whereby we are looking at the, the pasture. Uh, whether the 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 the, the felt is actually uh, the the fetch is actually healthy, so that if it's not healthy, then uh, the the farmers can do what we call rotation or rest grazing system, whereby they are actually rest uh, at different camps or fields and use uh, other fields throughout different seasons or di different years. This actually, uh, this information actually assists them to, 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 to develop some risk management uh, and coping strategies. So this is also the kind of information that will assist the municipality or government to actually know uh, where to uh, deploy their resources in terms of whether it's food or, or, or funding as well, should drought occurs or any other, uh, um, any other, kind of disaster due to climate change. So we also look at uh, deforestation mapping, uh, which we know that uh, if we lose uh, forests, then there's carbon, then that uh, contributes to climate change. So uh, we map the extent and the intensity of the of 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 deforestation. For instance, the the, the red areas that's basically where the the high this high uh, uh, deforestation, which is actually driven by uh, um, urbanization. So people are, are, are cutting down trees so that they can build houses. So as you can see that uh, this is basically from uh, the coastal uh, provinces in South Africa, uh, which is called Eastern Cape. So we're just mapping the, the coastal forest, that indigenous forests. So we can see the moderate, which is orange, and see the areas where there's low deforestation. But the areas where there's high deforestation is mainly because of uh, uh, urbanization. So also the forest type uh, mapping. Uh, whereby, for instance, in this case, we're mapping eucalyptus and pine extent and also the changes, uh, which is basically all we know that is, uh, as we know that uh, eucalyptus and pine, they affect uh, water resources 
Uh, so this information is also very important for the Department of Water and Sanitation and also the municipalities for actually monitoring if the, the, the plantation owners are complying with the, 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 the rules that are, have been stipulated by the Department of, 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 of Water and Sanitation. And also, as we know that eucalyptus and pine are, are also are known as invasive species, we have a huge challenge in South Africa of having them as, as, as invasive species as well. So we can also use uh, the, the, the technology to map uh, the extent of, of, of invasive species so that the uh, municipality can actually know where to start in terms of removing the, the what you call the, the invasive species. And also we can use it to map uh, green spaces in urban areas whereby green state places include uh, stadia, stadia um, parks, the trees in between the houses, so that uh, we, we, we ensure that the, 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 the urban areas are almost green, if not all the time, uh, so that we avoid things like having poor air quality, which results into uh, diseases, et cetera. So we can also map the changes uh, in different years. As you can see here, it's 2021, 2022, and 2023. So uh, moving to water resources management, uh, like I explained in the in vegetation, so water also has uh, 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 a different uh, spectral signature, and it it's it's it it has a higher reflectance in uh, visible spectrum, and also you can see. Uh, the, the 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 different spectral signatures, which are caused basically by the I would say the the pollution because you see the, the water that has a lot of sediments has high uh, 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 reflectance. The one with has vegetation or algae, which is chlorophyll. Uh, we see that so the water that is clean is actually has uh, lower reflectance. Uh, Etc. So this is the kind of information that we can derive from uh, the the satellite imagery, which we use to actually uh, do various application for 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 various applications such as water quality. So um, so the applications uh, for water resources include uh, water quality, as I've just shown you. I'm still going to show you uh, uh, other um, examples and watershed management, floodplain management, groundwater exploration, irrigation management, water uh, body mapping, and others. These are not limited to this, but this is just uh, a list that we've put together. For instance, the water quality uh, in, in oceans and inland, we have uh, used, like we use uh, different types of satellites uh, to, to monitor that, like MERIS, uh, which was uh, observing the red tide in 2022, and also mapping the chlorophyll in the inland dams, which is basically a a in a result of uh, the algae, and also uh, monitoring the the water quality in dams. As you can see uh, here, so the we monitored the dam from January 2016 to July 26 to July 2016. So uh, the blue means low. Uh, that is good quality, so or low uh, intensity of algae. And then green means medium, red means high intensity of algae. So as you can see the progression uh, from, from January to, 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 to July, and you see that uh, where I'm pointing, that's where there's high intensity of algae in the dam. This is one of the dams in the north, Northwest province in South Africa, and also the turbidity monitoring. Uh, so basically, we monitor uh, turbidity using one of the indices, uh, which is basically turbidity is basically uh, the, the 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 clarity of a liquid that is the, the the cloudy how cloudy the the, the water is. So we monitor which is normally caused by sediments and other particles that are in the in the in the in the water. So also again still on water quality. Uh, then he, on your left, you see that this is just a normal satellite image. And then this is the NDVI, which shows the, the intensity of, 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 of the algae in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the dam. And then we have uh, we, what we call um, evapotranspiration, which is basically um, 
the loss of water uh, to the atmosphere through evaporation and transpiration from the from from vegetation, which is merely a a process or uh, which is affected by by temperature as well. So uh, as you can see on the left, these are these are croplands. Uh, so uh, the the blue means there's high ET. Uh, so what we know about ET is that it's it's directly uh, 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 related to the, the the crop yield. So which means uh, the higher the ET, the higher the the, the crop yield. So and also um, the areas that has like I said, the areas that have purple that means they have high uh, evapor evapotranspiration, and then the red that is where there's there's low uh, evapotranspiration, and also soil moisture. Uh, we have various instruments and various satellites that uh, provides information on, on soil moisture like ASCAT, MODIS, etc., which uh, the information is important for irrigation scheduling, plant disease forecasting, soil health monitoring, and water balance studies. Uh, and also uh, the mapping of wetlands, their extent, their, their, their status, uh, whether they are degraded, where they are, and uh, yeah, so that is the kind of information also that we can derive from uh, satellite images. We can use Landsat, we can use uh, Sentinel, we can use Sentinel-1 and 2 to map water bodies, which I'll just show you now. So basically uh, also the water body mapping, we also have a system called Mzanzi Amanzi, as you can see the, the, the link, which actually uh, gives information, monthly information on the uh, water body extent and also the the dam volumes uh, so uh, this is this can be accessed it's live uh, and then you can get uh, the information but this is only for south africa of course this is updated in monthly places the information is derived from sentinel 1 and sentinel 2 so and then in terms of groundwater water exploration also we use uh, various satellite images such as landsat uh, the, the SAR data, Sentinel-1, ALOS, to actually map the structures or geologic structures, which actually use, are used to identify zones of recharge. Uh, so we use to map the faults, your faults, your all the linear, linear maintenance. Ah, sorry, <laughs> yeah. But yeah, so we use to map the faults uh, and other structures that are related to uh, 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 the, the, the groundwater. <laughs> And also we use uh, the, the, the technology to actually um, monitor the water use. Uh, the Department of Water and Sanitation monitors water use in terms of uh, the irrigation, how much water is being used uh, and who's using what. So um, this kind of uh, technology actually provides us information on that. As you can see on the left, uh, so uh, the, the yellowish uh, part is basically the non-irrigated uh, areas and then the the the, the greenish are the, uh, the irrigated areas which basically uh, provides the municipality with information of who owns what and where is each field then they know uh, who uses uh, water for irrigation and they just check if they comply so uh, also uh, we use the technology through uh, the digital earth sorry, <laughs> the DMs <laughs> um, for water flow channel modeling. Uh, we use what we call, uh, uh, the, the, you have what we call the SRTM, we have the ASTA uh, GDM. Uh, so this is the kind of information that we do for hydrological and geohydrological modeling. Uh, I think that is all, thank you. Um, good evening, good morning, good day to everyone on the platform. Um, it's good to be here. Yeah, so my name is um, Lerato Shikwambana, and I'm a CNS scientist within the Earth Observation Group in Sansa. And my interest are in air quality, um, climate, and atmospheric um, remote sensing. Um, but for today's purpose, I'll just take you through the air quality as 
um, work that I do or that I'm interested in. So there are various sources of there are various sources of, of air pollution, both indoor and outdoor. But the real interest that I have is the outdoor pollution, um, which is uh, which uh, the sources are shown in this figure here. Um, so power plants are a major source um, within the South African context because we've got more than 12 active um, coal powered fire stations and they contribute a lot um, towards climate change and um, air, air, air quality. Emissions um, from vehicles is also a big concern. We've seen over time the number of cars that are on the road um, have been increasing, increasingly um, drastically. There are measures to try and cap the emissions through using, you know, um, refining the fuel and just um, even the engine itself to try and emit as less of the pollutant as possible. Biomass busing is also of concern. Um, uh, wildfires are promit prominent in, in, in South Africa and also get um, a lot of emissions from this biomass burning process. So air pollution is basically airborne particles and gases that occur in concentrations that can endanger the health and the well-being of, of organisms. So we've got two types of, of pollutants. Um, we've got the primary pollutants, which are emitted directly from an identifiable source. For example, the power plant will emit like sulfur dioxide into the atmosphere. So that will be a direct uh, primary pollutant. And secondary pollutants are now these primary pollutants interacting chemically to form new species of, of uh, pollutants. Um, this, you know, one example of that is smog. Yeah, so we've showed the the, the sources um, of of the various sources of pollution of of pollutants, and I like this figure because it basically shows um, the two or rather two um, uh, emittents that affect the different um, parts. So here we've got particulate matter which are emitted mostly from vehicles, um, you know, like and your ships, your transport, that is your airplanes, and these will um, especially the ones that are on the surface will impact directly on human health, um, like your lung disease and um, illnesses, asthma or, or cancer. And we also get carbon dioxide being emitted, which we know directly affects um, global warming. So the next um, figure here that's got a pyramid is also of interest to me because it, this is um, the effects direct of air pollution to human health. Um, so the more uh, the more we, we, we emit, we could see that the pyramid obviously gets smaller. Um, so you will start up with the lung functions, um, mal malfunctions of, of, of your lungs and diseases. And as the intensity of air pollution increases, it will eventually um, lead to death. So this is what is very of um, great concern. So the beauty is that uh, these pollutants can um, be removed from the atmosphere um, through um, these two processes. Um, so we've got the dry deposition process, which it basically just says that if uh, um, these gases or particles will, will fall directly to the back to the surface of the earth, depending also on the depending on um, being pulled by gravity and the size of the of the particles itself, and then we've got wet deposition processes. So this is where the pollutants. Um, will scavenge um, water vapor in the atmosphere and form clouds, and then they will come down as as acid drain. And then they, 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 yeah, then obviously they will then impact on the water quality um, that was presented by a previous speaker. So yeah, so this is just an example here where we have a power station where we have these particles, pollutants that are that are produced through the um, the process of producing electricity. So, like I said, if the particles are heavy, they will fall down in a dry deposition manner, and those and some will then interact with the water vapor in the atmosphere and then fall down as as wet deposition. So there are various um, data set that we are using for air pollution studies. Uh, so I've just listed um, just a few. I mean, there's many, many um, satellite data and reanalysis data that's being used. Um, so Mira 2 
um, data set. It's a real analysis data. Um, the beauty about the Mira 2 data is that it's got a, the data starts in 1980 till present. So if you want historic data and, and if you want to do modeling and trends, um, you know, training of, of, of models, this is a good data set to use um, for predictive studies. And then we've got the, the tropomy, which is what most of us now within the air quality uh, space used because of the, the better resolution that it has and also it uh, can measure various um, types of, of pollutants. Um, so I just showed here, I just show here um, the Google Earth Engine environment where we actually process the, the tropomy data. So in this, this instance, um, this is the Gauteng province, so, so one of the eight, nine provinces within South Africa, very dense uh, place, urbanized, and uh, yeah, we're just showing the distribution of carbon monoxide in one of these periods. And then we've got um, Calypso, which is a uh, which is a space-borne lidar. Um, it's also been op in operation since 2006, so there's also a good data set on it. And the beauty about Calypso, it's this ability to give us the vertical distributions of 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 these pollutants from ground until uh, the top of the troposphere, say 13, 14 kilometers. So these are just, so I'm just going to show a few examples of the data sets that we've analyzed using um, yeah, different data. So here we have um, um, the sulfur, sulfate, um, sulfate. Um, so sulfate is also it's a byproduct from um, um, coal, coal fired power station. So this is one of the emittents that gets, gets produced. These are particles, uh, which we refer to them as aerosols as well. And then we did a study around, uh, this is some provinces of South Africa, where we see the spatial distribution of, of, of the SO4, um, same as the SO2. And then also, yeah, to also show the, the distribution of uh, nitrogen dioxide. So these were taken from um, Mira2 um, data. And then I also mentioned the tropomy, um, which is the troposphoric monitoring instrument. So this is on board the Sentinel 5P and uh, this was launched on the 13th of October 2017. And yeah, so so far the, the instrument itself has shown success in collecting uh, the data and that data can be used for, for, for air quality uh, purposes. So some of the products that we get from Sentinel 5P or Tropomi I've listed them here. So we've got sulfur dioxide, um, nitrogen dioxide, we've got ozone, carbon monoxide, and methane. But me methane, we use it mostly for um, for climate for climate studies, um, not really for 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 air quality purposes. Um, so tropomy is going to revisit time of less than a day. Um, like I said, so it's got um, for our for our purposes of of monitoring and research, we we prefer the real near time or the offline um, um, data. So this is, um, these are the, some of the results, the, uh, some research that we did within Sansa, um, looking at the emissions of nitrogen dioxide um, from aircrafts at two um, airports, the Oar Tambo International Airport in Johannesburg and the Cape Town um, International Airport. So the first three um, figures shows the airspace for um, for or, or Tambo International Airport. So April 2019, we measured the nitrogen dioxide because we know that nitrogen dioxide is a byproduct of, 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 of aircraft as they idle, you know, as they come through the runway, um, they emit a lot of, 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 of this NO2 and as, as they take off as well. So we measured the NO2 um, before the lockdown period, which was 2019 in April, when the white box basically show where the, where the, airport is, we see a, a lot of uh, NO2. Um, there are various sources, like you said, but the primary emissions are from aircraft. So if you look at the same time in during the lockdown period, I mean, um, we see that there was less NO2 um, emissions from the airport because um, no planes, uh, all the planes were grounded. So there were um, air travel was, rest was restricted. And then we did the same, we looked at the same area a year later and we could see um, NO2 started picking up because, uh, yeah, now air traffic was increasing. 
So we saw the same thing as well at the bottom three figures here for the Cape Town International Airport. So we also looked at the uh, emissions now from from vehicles, vehicle emissions on the major highways within Gauteng province in South Africa. We basically looked at two gases. We looked at the nitrogen dioxide gas, which is also primar primarily primary from petrol engines and the carbon monoxide, which is from diesel engines. Um, so we looked at the different times. We also looked, looked at, we used lockdown as a, as a good study period uh, because there was that time where nothing was moving. So before the lockdown in 2020, we see the rate which just shows moderate um, carbon monoxide um, from, from these vehicles on the major routes. And when we started the lockdown periods, we could see a decrease or the first week at least of the first month of the lockdown, so it a major decrease in the carbon monoxide. Um, also, also, we saw the same trend as well um, for 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 NO2. For at least there's, uh, there's a book chapter. Okay, so coming to air quality itself, um, so I just like this picture because it shows what air quality sort of means. So the top picture shows a clear day, no hazy things. Um, looks the air looks fresh, clean. Whereas the bottom one, yeah, I can see that there is some smoke and some yeah, not so nice um environment out there. So um, so calculating the air quality. Um, so a lot of work has been done where air quality air quality calculations are done using mostly ground based data. Um, but for this, what we want to do is use satellite data. Um purely because um, we don't have enough ground stations to cover the whole of the country, whereas we know that satellite um, can cover the country and can have access to every part of the country. So, but we should follow the same, or we follow the same methods that have been used by, by other researchers, where we would collect the, the measurements um, in terms of either concentrations or column densities. We would then um, um, calculate the sub-index. So there's formulas that we, we use to calculate the sub index for all the different types of pollutants, and then you just aggregate the the sub index to get um, the the final air quality index. So so this is the preliminary results that we have. Um, so we've started the the project. So of course this is the picture of South Africa. So we looked at a period of between one and five September, twenty twenty two. And uh, yeah, so green basically means that the uh, air quality is good. Blue means moderate, uh, red, and um, and it's orange. Yeah, um, hazardous to very unhealthy. Um, so what we expect is is that well, what we see basically is this province here, um, Pomalanga. We see that the air quality is very very bad. It's hazardous because that's where we have most of our power stations. So. We've noticed that places with more power stations would result the area would be contaminated by air pollution and air quality would be would be low. Um, yeah, so that's where we are with this with this project um, of calculating air quality index. So for cal calculating the the index here, we basically just use four gases: we use sulfur dioxide, nitrogen dioxide, carbon monoxide, and ozone. So the plan is to increase the number of gases so that um, our results would get um, a bit more accurate. Um, thank you. Oh, so <laughs> sorry, I thought I was done. Okay, so yeah, so in general, in conclusion, um, so so we basic basically uh, what we have um, is that when we have emissions, we've got the air quality component and we've got the greenhouse greenhouse gas um, emissions um, component. So in the greenhouse gases, like I said, you've got the methane, you've got carbon, di carbon dioxide, and you've got your, your nitrate as well. And then if you analyze this, you can calculate global global warming and climate change. And then other sources that are air quality or air pollution, um, air, air contaminates would be your um, particulate matters, your sulfur dioxides, and this would um, have an effect on, on human health um, crop sealed and acidification. Thanks.
Good day. Uh, good afternoon. Good evening. Attendees from all over across the world. Um, I hope everyone has been uh, jotting down questions as after this uh, presentation will be opening for Q&A session. Um, I will be presenting on human settlement and disaster management. Uh, my name is Morwapula Mashalani. The current presentation that I'm going to be giving has been prepared by my colleague. And then it deals with these are uh, with human settlements. Um, the services provided by municipalities or government vary. Uh, it goes through from uh, creation of policies to the financial plannings to urban development to planning of uh, physical infrastructure to environmental plannings to social infrastructure and services um, that people uh, require. And as you may be aware, all other services and every single effort that we do, we do it for the benefit of people. Therefore, remote sensing is a great tool for that as it allows us to do a lot of our planning, as it allows us to collate a lot of intelligence for enabling us to provide these services better. So when trying to understand the human component, we do that through understanding the human settlements. One, um, the settlements that have higher uh, urbanization, and then we know exactly where those are, and then um, the increased land for habitation, that is we're checking how much of the land is consumed um, in terms of from whatever activity that was happening there to human settlements. As we know that with human settlements, generally human settlements are permanent. So if, say for example, land that has been used for agriculture has now been developed to be used as a residential, chances are that land has been lost uh, permanently because it will never be taken back to being used as uh, agriculture. So human settlements, indicate where people live, where people socialize, where people work, where people do all other activities that they need. And they, these human settlements are indi an indicator of population because population is not, uh, population numbers, numbers are not always up to date. So remote sensing can be used to estimate population growth as well. The high spatial resolution imagery provides us with uh, data to map and monitor settlements of all kinds. My colleague spoke about different types of resolutions, one not being the spatial resolution. The high resolution, uh, the high resolution imagery enables us to see the smallest uh, unit being a house or be it maybe a two meter or a three meter by three meter uh, single hut or room or house, housing structure. It allows us to see that and therefore we map that into the database. And then human settlements also give an indication of the standard of living. So looking at the kind of uh, housing structure that is there, we're able to tell or even class different individuals that are staying there. We can class them according to those who are opulent, those that are affording their money, and those who are middle class, and those, those who are lower class, and also in terms of uh, being poor or not, in terms of being access to services or not, so on and so forth, which is extremely important when it comes to the planning of services. Also assess urban growth, uh, that is in terms of settlements, uh, we check uh, how much of 
land is being developed and then of the land that is being developed, how much of the land being developed is settlements for residential, how much of it is uh, factories, warehouses and so forth, uh, how much of it is malls, how much of it is upper class uh, residential, middle class residential, lower class residential, so on and so forth. And this is extremely important for planning of services as it allows us and it also enables us to know exactly where new services are required and what type of services are required there. Another phenomenon which we have in South Africa and I believe across the world is called informal settlements. Uh, in other parts of the world, uh, I'm just not sure if the definition quite matches. They are defined as uh, slums. In South Africa, we call them informal settlements because they haven't been formalized. Uh, and this globally over 1 billion people live in slums across the world. Uh, and then urbanization uh, increases development of informal settlements or these slums as uh, people from across uh, the globe are moving to city centers in search for better opportunities in terms of work, in terms of uh, better access to services, hospitals, schools, so on and so forth. Uh, they have an illegality component of it, uh, as in the sense that they are informal and they often lack uh, access to services. Uh, the people there are vulnerable to uh, natural and man-made disasters as some build their uh, slums within uh, wetlands with, uh, along the river areas where the uh, those particular housing structures can easily be washed away. Some are even building uh, on top of servitude. Uh, some are even building on top of landfill sites at times in certain countries. And that may lead to a very high environmental uh, degradation. So in South Africa, we are mapping this in former settlements using remote sensing, uh, indicating the areas that require services, uh, also monitoring their growth because authorities also are interested in, in South Africa, they're interested in formalizing these areas, that is um, restructuring the areas, providing people with adequate housing, providing people with adequate services in terms of uh, sanitation, in terms of sanitation, in terms of uh, access to schools, access to other services, uh, in term, including retail, malls, and so forth. So using remote sensing, we monitor this, and then we map them in terms of area, how big a particular informal settlement is, or a slum, and also we can even go into an individual, to the extent of uh, providing the number of individual structures are there and also we can even go on and uh, estimate the population, the number of people are, that are in that particular informal settlement. Connectivity and access, uh, accessibility of settlements. Um, there is another phenomenon in South Africa where we have what we call uh, rural villages and these rural villages often uh, are connected through gravel road. What we call gravel road is a road that is not ted, it's not tar road. Um, and then these often do not have, they ha often have connectivity issues, whether to the nearest clinic, to the nearest hospital, to the nearest school, you find that that particular uh, village is located very far from schools and then uh, the kids have to attend school every day, hence walking kilometers and kilometers to and from schools per day. So we use this technology to, uh, uh, to assess connectiv uh, connectivity and accessibility to different services and therefore it assists in planning for new services. Say we know that um, 
by law, by legislature, all the people have to be within, say, for example, five kilometer from a particular hospital. And then we can check from one hospital or clinic, and then we check those uh, uh, villages that are within one kilometer of that particular clinic, which means they have higher accessibility to that particular clinic. And then those that fall outside that, then in planning for the next clinic that's going to be built in the area, we know that we will place it in an area where it will, it will cover those other villages that uh, fall outside of the five kilometer. So it assists us in planning a lot. So assessment of uh, the areas that acquire services, I think, yeah, I had given this example. Uh, for example, on this, you see in South Africa by law, health services should be within five kilometers of settlements. So which means that once particular settlement falls outside of that, then uh, future plans must ensure that those uh, villages uh, are going to be built or are going to be provided with a clinic or a health center or whatever. And then Earth observation, remote sensing allows us to be able to identify those uh, uh, settlements that are very far from the required services. And then accessibility is assessed in terms of road network. If there is a good road or a tired road or it's a gravel road, so on and so forth. And then we also identify new suitable sites for, for the future building of a clinic or of a school or anything. So on this slide, the green settlements, those are the settlements uh, within uh, five kilometer, I mean 25, five, um, within the required distance of hospitals. And then the yellow are those within the five kilometer of clinics. And then the red ones, the, that is where there is no clinic in the, uh, I mean, within five kilometer uh, radius. So which means that if the future uh, the future plans of building a clinic or a hospital will be along the red villages that are indicated there. Suitability studies, uh, we also you look at the settlement density, uh, the existing services within the, uh, that particular settlements, and then also the identification of suitable sites. With, uh, with the previous slide, one could be suitability for building a new clinic. The other can be suitability for building a shopping uh, mall or complex. The other could be the building of a school. The other, any other service that uh, the people require. And also the suitability in terms of environmental management as well. Suitability, looking at whether the settlements are being built uh, within a flood, a plain or a flood risk area being built within uh, a wetland or even uh, in an area where there is an endangered uh, fauna and flora as well, because we also tasked to protect uh, those. Uh, the technology also allows us to monitor development in terms of infrastructure. And then with this slide, we are able to see what we see there, that is the new school. So when this development happened in that area, there was no school, but uh, as part of the planning, the, the school was planned to be built there so that the new uh, people who are going to be living in that area can have easy access to, to, to the schools. Can also uh, monitor roads in terms of transformation uh, from a tarred road to, I mean, from a gravel road to a tarred road as well. Understanding the environmental conditions of uh, human settlements, um, the earth observation te technology allows us to uh, assess the land surface temperature and also that contributes to the urban heat islands, 
also uh, the vegetation as well, which is important as for also for air quality as well. So for this, we use different indices. Um, uh, we know that the, there are studies that we also did um, in South Africa. There's one on um, the surface temperature which was conducted in a in, uh, in, uh, township setup where there are no vegetation in Johannesburg. And then it found that the, the the temperatures in the township where there's no vegetation, they are generally much higher uh, than uh, those in the adjacent uh, suburban area where they find that there's a lot of vegetation. So which tells you that the people who, who are at risk of uh, suffering heat strokes or heat related illnesses are uh, generally found in uh, townships where they, there's actually very high uh, land surface temperatures compared to, to their urban uh, counterparts or suburban counterparts where the temperatures are generally lower and it's cooler. There. So the studies, um, the ones uh, you can see on the slide, they are there. Uh, for the assessment of ecological conditions of informal settlements and also eco-environmental quality assessments. These studies you can also look at and also there's the study that I spoke about conducted by uh, one of our colleagues here at Sansa, Dr. Larato, is also there. Uh, I think it was published within spring as well. Um, so not only in addition to uh, what we are able to see using remote sensing technology is in illegal dumping. Um, a high, a very high resolution imagery enables us to do that. And then um, that assists in terms of increased awareness, preparedness, and also the improvement of uh, collection services that also improves the health because people um, cannot be living within uh, this kind of areas where there is uh, landfills or trash everywhere, which has been dubbed in rivers and also in the overall environment posing a threat. Um, the density of um, settlements can also be assessed using remote sensing and this assists because um, we it also allows us to um, predict or study where there will be a high risk of uh, disease transmissions, especially those are uh, those diseases that are waterborne or airborne, um, especially even during uh, the COVID lockdown. It was very much important for us to uh, assess those settlements that where there is higher density because once uh, there is a case uh, locked there, there's a, there's a higher chance that there will be more people affected with that particular disease. Um, Safety and also monitoring the building within the servitudes. Um, in South Africa, again, uh, people are not allowed to build under our high voltage power lines. So as you see on this screen, we have people who have built informal structures under a high voltage, a high voltage uh, electricity line. That is not allowed. Therefore, using a remote sensing, we are able to monitor these servitudes. It can be a pipeline, it can be an oil line, it can be a, a water line, it can be uh, an electricity line as well that uh, we monitor that people, even a railway line, we monitor that people do not build there because by law that is not allowed and it pose a safety or a hazard to 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 the individuals in that area again we also look at uh, the population growth in terms of land consumption so you find that um, i mean land is a very valuable resource and is becoming very 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 much scarce and generally find that people are consuming more and more land and therefore that is not sustainable especially looking i mean going into the future 
the future generations may not have access to land as the current generation does. As a result, we assess how that particular land is being consumed in uh, in relation or yeah in comparison to the population then. So what we generally see is that in key uh, metropolitan areas, land consumption is reduced as there are high rise buildings that are being uh, built while in the uh, traditionally smaller towns or rural towns we find that uh, more land is being consumed by fewer people because uh, people build new new stands i mean new areas and it's a single household find that the single household con uh, occupies a whole hectare or even more sometimes while in the city in a city you find that within a 500 square meter there is one building with uh, apartment building with 100 apartments so more people are consuming less land there compared to in the rural areas such uh, also in the farm areas you find one 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 family occupying thousands of hectares alone Uh, that is also very much important in terms of planning and also for reporting in terms of the United Nations uh, Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, also, the access to services. Uh, we also assess which people uh, have access to those particular services, in this case, electricity, and uh, in areas where we, there are some areas where we don't have uh, in terms of statistics of the consumption, but we might know that they have access to the service, but in terms of consumption, it might be a, a bit of a lack there. Now, coming to disaster, to true disasters. Disasters in South Africa, the ones that occur more readily is flooding. For example, now there's flooding that is occurring in, occurring in Cape Town, in the Western Cape. Um, there's also wildfires that occur quite uh, are quite prevalent, and also the, there's also drought. So those are the key uh, disasters that we encounter in South Africa. And then with the drought, we use vegetation indices as indicators. Uh, my colleague Nosi. Uh, uh, did explain some of these indices, uh, looking at the vegetation greenness, veg looking at uh, vegetation uh, conditions as well, other vegetation conditions, and then we're able to use that to as, a, as indicators of drought and also uh, surface water as well as an indicator of drought. She spoke to that. We have another, which is fires. So fires are uh, a regular occurrence this side of the world, especially uh, wildfires. And with this, the service that we use the remote sensing for one is uh, monitoring once a fire uh, starts and it gets to just above 50 meters. Uh, satellite technology able, is able to detect that and set an alert to um, fire authorities or the local authorities there to uh, alert them about the fire and then we also do investigations as to where the fire started how it uh, bent uh, uh, according to the wind direction which was there at the time and then we also assess how much in terms of uh, the area bent what was there prior to the fire happening for insurance purposes, for legal purposes, so on and so, so on and so forth. So we are able to just give in terms of hectareage, how much got burned, how much of it was there. If somebody is claiming that they had planted a particular crop there, we also verify if indeed there was that particular crop there. Another one which is currently also happening in the Western Cape is floods. Floods are a major hazard that is causing a lot of uh, damage and cost to the economy in South Africa. And with this, we have developed what we call a flood risk tool, which enables us to identify those properties that are within a, a flood, what we call a flood risk area. And then we use this to 
warn as an early warning to warn of uh, the potential flooding that may occur in an, any area. An example is this, it's a village where we have indicated those households that are too close to the river that should water level rises uh, one meter, three meters to five meters uh, above the riverbed, those particular households uh, will be flooded. And then using that, then we what we do what we call a flood risk profile, where we are profiling the amount of structures that uh, are at risk of being flooded, and and also uh, classify them whether they are being traditionally residential, whether they are urban, whether they are informal settlements, so on and so forth. And also we do in situ flood mapping where we use synthetic aperture radar data. We also where uh, it enables us to see or assess the flooding as it is happening even when there is cloud cover and then we can uh, map the water overflow or water discharge from various rivers and also uh, advise uh, authorities. Post flooding, uh, we do damage assessment. This is in one example where we use satellite imagery to assess the uh, settlements that had been uh, flooded. This is the case of 22, 2022 flooding in KZN, and also we assess where a road or a bridge has been washed away, where different structures in terms of household also have been uh, damaged and uh, destroyed, where also there's inundation in that particular settlement, where we know that in that informal settlement there was a lot of uh, inundation and then um, waste water treatment plants as well so suppose one also uh, when you wanna um, assess where there is a likelihood of waterborne diseases that uh, outbreak likely to okay you wanna assess that it will be downstream of such uh, and also another way we had a mine uh, dam that burst as well, uh, damaging the inf the environment and also people's households there. We also did assessment on that and also downstream to uh, the largest dam is to uh, where we're assessing where the sludge and all that effect from the uh, mine dam, what the damage, uh, where the damage ended. Thank you very much. Um, I'll be giving to my colleague who will take you through data integration. Thank you very much. Morning, afternoon, and good evening to everyone. The session on data integration, we will move it during the practicals. Um, we'll demonstrate it there. So for now, we're just going to go straight to data access. So the data access platform that we have here at Sansa, this part has been covered by our first speaker, where they're talking about the act of Sansa. So Sansa, we are also appointed as a base data set coordinator for the satellite theme imagery in South Africa. Um, the data platforms that will cover at Sansa is the data catalog where you will access the satellite imagery, decision support tool where you will be able to access various data sets such as the vegetation, the flood data and human settlement layer. The Mzanze Amanzi portal for water data uh, will also introduce you to the digital Earth South Africa platform and remote sensing atlas and the Fundisa learning portal. So these are some of the satellite imageries that we have here at Sansa. Um, the latest one which we've been added to our portfolio is the CBUS 4A, which we started receiving it in August. Um, the resolution for the CBUS one is the two meter pen and the eight meter uh, multispectral one. So for the coverage of the SEDEC, it's of CBUS, it's in SEDEC over the, our region. Um, the area in yellow, this is the area where we have direct, where we are able to receive any direct imagery. 
currently we are directly receiving here Lancet 8 and 9, our CBUS 4 and Modis Terra and Aquam. Um, the area here is our Sansa Ground Receiving Station, which is located at Sansa Space Operation. Uh, we do have an archive of radar set two um, of, uh, active SAD data. For radar set two, the area that we have is over the South African EEZ and over the Marian Island. Mostly this data it was being used for the project that we call the SMS, where they were monitoring our coastline for any illegal activities. These are some of the example of the satellite imagery that we hosted Sansa from the Landsat with a spatial resolution of 30 meter, Sumbanira set, our very own satellite, uh, which is 6.25, the spot data, 2.5 meter. Over here, we've got the spot 6, 1.5 meter, and then other data set that we provide or our reseller also is the Hydro Pleiades and Worldview 30 centimeter one. Uh, we do have our online catalog where you can browse and search satellite imagery. Um, uh, it allows you to search, but for you to order, we'll need to be logged in into the system. This is the link here where you can order it. If you have any challenges accessing our data catalog, you can also contact our customer services. Um, we have a decision support tool. On the decision support tool, what we have, we've got our base maps. On this one, we've got the blood inundation layer, which shows areas that can be potentially flooded at one meter, three meter, and five meter. Also on the support decision support tool, it also have um, settlement layer. The coverage for this one, it's only covering South Africa. So from the decision tool, you can also view and download the vegetation layers, which Nosi was speaking about, and some of the layers there is the water data sets. Um, at Sansa, we recently launched last year a platform called the Digital Earth South Africa. So Digital L South Africa is an online platform which allows users to process spot imagery. Currently, we've got spot six and seven analysis ready data. The data is already being pre-processed. It's just ready for you to analyze. Uh, the architecture of the system. Um, we've got the data cube in our data cube we've got spot and lancet mainly the focus for sansa when we developed the digital L south africa was to ensure that our spot archive is accessible online and can be pre-processed there so on the system there we've got about three application libraries which were already developed there the ndvi one the land cover water quality and the settlement one, this can be done using the Jupyter Notebook. So as a user, you will have to register and then run your analysis online on the DESA platform. You can just download the results to your, to your machine. Um, some of the portal that we have is the Mzanzi Amanzi. So Mzanzi Amanzi, that's where you can access the water volume data. This one is updated monthly. Um, the data that is here, it was we use Sentinel-2 and currently now it's running on Sentinel-1. So the coverage is over South Africa. We also have a learning resources center where we have the South African Remote Sensing Atlas. On this atlas, you can have access to the introduction to remote sensing, the history of space technology in South Africa. You can also check South African satellite and application of satellite imagery. So some of the stuff that we have covered here, they've been covered. You can have access to it on this platform called the Remote Sensing Atlas. We also develop what we call a Fundisa portal. On the Fundisa portal, it's more of on tutorials on remote sensing and GIS. Uh, you can 
learn basic remote sensing skills from image processing, mosaicing, basic GIS skills such as buffering. Yeah. We also develop some learning resources which are mainly targeted to high school and primary school learners where we offer basic GIS tutorials which are linked to their curriculum, remote sensing tutorials and also educational materials such as the EO games on, on this platform. Um, here we've got other sources of special information in South Africa. Uh, here I've just listed a list of data sets and links where you can access this data. In terms of aerial imagery, you can access it from the CDI website listed here, the land cover data from the Department of Environmental Affairs, cadastral data, wetlands data over here, the other water data set that our government is developing, it deriving is over here, then you can also download municipality and administrative boundary from the municipal demarcation board. In terms of others, we also just selected the World Bank Your Special Catalog. And then for worldwide satellite imagery, you can also have a look at the USGS catalog, which mostly focus on the provision of Lancet data. And you can also have a look at the ESA catalog, which is mainly for Sentinel data sets. So you can also have a look at the Africa Geo Portal, where it has different um, Africa data sets. Thank you. Thank you um, for your attention. I think we we are happy to take questions. We have a um, few minutes before before um, our break. I think there were a number of questions um, on mm, the yes. chat. Yes, some we have responded to. Otherwise, mm -hmm. we hope that uh, the presentations have um, demonstrated how we can use Earth observation data and um, geospatial technologies to support decision making in in local municipalities or by government or service providers at large. Um, so I don't know how you want us to 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 continue from here in terms of the questions. Um, yes, yes. Well, thanks. So first of all, thank you so much to the trainers from Sensa for the wonderful presentations. They were very informative and it covered a right range of interesting topics. So thank you so much. So we have about 15 minutes. Uh, we, we will begin a Q&A session now. Um, due to the time constraint, we will not be able to address all the questions, but we will be able to address a few of them live. And our trainers will respond to the other questions in the chat during the break. So uh, we have a very active conversation going Going on, and I've uh, the first question from our on online audience is about vegetation. I guess it's re relevant to the presentation from Nosy's Echo. So the question is, when you when you characterize vegetation stress using the chlorophyll content in remote sensing images, how do you tell the difference between nutrition deficiency and disease symptoms, since both conditions? Post similar spectra response. Would Nosi um, Zeko take the question or um, Nali um, will take the question? Yes, Nosi just, just stepped out, but otherwise she had responded to the question, um, saying that the aim is to alert the farmers of um, areas where there could be a problem. So in terms of whether it's stress or if the stress is caused by chlorophyll content or by nutrition deficiency or disease, some disease, uh, we won't be able to tell from the imagery um, using the data that we have access to. Uh, but I think uh, as we go forward, if we access higher spatial hyperspectral resolution data, we'll be able to uh, tell. But of course, that will require a lot of uh, field information. So for now, we 
um, once we identify that there is an issue in a particular field, uh, what is important is to alert the the farmers who will then go in detail, I mean, on the field to check what could be the problem. So it, it will just save time or otherwise it will just give them an, a good information in terms of where the problem could be. We might not be able to tell exactly what, what it is, but uh, they will know where to focus uh, on. Mm. All right, thank you. Now the next question is about insurance. So it was mentioned during the presentation that insurance companies use satellite imagery to verify the validity of insurance claims. So for example, if a farmer is claiming for loss of income due to crop failure, perhaps due to a natural event such as a drought or a flood, then satellite imagery will be used to prove that the crop has indeed been planted prior to the natural yes. event and that the natural event did cause the loss in crop. So could you please explain the ideal characteristics of satellite imagery that would suit such a purpose, perhaps in terms of the frequency or the spatial resolution? Yes, so um, the, the advantage of using satellite images, especially when we have an archive of historical image, is that we are able to go back and um, zoom into the area that is in question and see what was the condition in terms of if it's a farm, what was planted or if it was planted at all. So if a farmer is claiming a loss which could have been caused by a disaster and we have a date of a disaster, we can go back and check um, uh, on our archive and assess whether what the farmer is claiming is correct. So. Mm -hmm we need access to the to the um to the data so if it's a small field it means that we may need then high resolution data um so for south africa since we have access to spot it, it could be um useful but it also depends on the date of the disaster but otherwise if we are looking at bigger commercial uh, fields we should be able to also get the information um, uh, historical data from either sentinel or landsat to enable us to then go back and assess whether the farm was planted if it was planted what is the size what was planted uh, depending also on on the availability of of ground information so we will we should be able to assess um, going back uh, using archive archive data but if mm -hmm. it's an incident that is saying on this particular date um, then yes, we need to get the data on that on that date. But otherwise, for assessment, we we should have access to historical images, including also spot two and four, landsat five. In fact, here at Sansa, a lot of uh, claims that we we get they are uh, they require the use of landsat five as like old landsat data, and also spot um, two two and four. And um, maybe we also did not include that it's actually one of the uh, applications where we are verifying what the insurance or the lawyers um, are saying in terms of um, claims or if someone should, um, uh, a department or if a farmer is suing ESCOM, for example, a power utility company. So we actually render that service and one of our, our specialists goes to to the courts and provide the evidence from satellite images and they they are um, satellite images are now considered as an um, a source of evidence from our courts in the country i hope i answered the question yes yeah, very good. Very interesting example. All right. The next question is about cloud interference. So we know that clouds may, uh, may obscure the images and disrupt the quality of the acquired satellite data. So the question is, do you have any pre-processing steps in place to remove such interference to improve your analysis? Or is it a matter of using a different type of remote sensing technology, such as synthetic aperture radar, known as SAR? So how do you remove the cloud interference? Is it a pre-processing step that you do or you, is it better to use a different technology? Um, it's one of the pre-processing steps that we apply mm -hmm. on, on image processing, amongst others such as the geometric correction where we are correcting terms of the um, 
location of the imagery and also radiometric where we also correct from uh, to the to ridens. So in terms of re cloud removal, uh, different softwares, remote sensing software such as NV, EDAS, PCI, Geometrica, they will use different algorithms. So one of the easiest one it to be to apply cloud masking where you would assign a value to mask out the clouds. So on the software that we'll be using now QGIS, you can remove the clouds under the processing toolbox where under raster pro processing. So yes, it can be done, but it also depends on do you want to completely remove it or do you just want to reduce in terms of atmospheric? Yeah, that is a processing step that you can do under pre-processing. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, great. Since you touch upon the topic of the uh, the topic about data analysis, um, I just want to remind our participants that this afternoon we will have a hands-on training, and you will get to learn more examples of how you can integrate and data from different sources and analyze them. So, just on this topic, I'm going to move on to the next question about data integration. So, our participant would like to know how do we incorporate data from complementary sources such as air quality and soil sensors to gather data and seamlessly integrate them into QGIS platform? Uh, in terms of data integration, you will need to first check in terms of projection of the data set, the type of data that you are integrating. Um, this can be done on QIGS where you can just load the data set. Um, a full presentation on data integration will be covered this afternoon and also a hands-on training on how you can do it. So I think for this one, we can leave it for the next afternoon session, which will dwell more on how to integrate it and also how to um, use it on QGIS. Yep, very interesting. So I would encourage all our participants to stay with us and join us again at the afternoon session. OK, so we have here two more questions. Uh, one is about early warning. So the question is, how can uh, remote sensing technology and geospatial data assist in improving the lead time when early warnings are issued. The issue that these participants face is that they often do not have sufficient time to evacuate those in danger on, and even warn, warn them about the disaster in advance. So in what ways can remote sensing data help? OK, um, thank you for the question. Great question. Um, generally, it it depends on um, how the efficiency of the of the disaster management authorities um, in South Africa. The risk uh, product that we have uh, can be used at any time. Can be used a week, a month, a uh, a year prior to a particular flooding happening in a particular area. However, the alerts are issued from our weather services in terms of rain, and then it tells us where exactly in this particular municipality or locality there will be flooding. There is a high potential of flooding because of uh, the incoming rain that is being predicted. That is generally the forecast usually is done three days prior, and then uh, the authorities have about three days to act should they uh, feel the need to do so. Um, so in other cases, they are able to uh, alert people and uh, evacuate people. In others, uh, such is not the case. Um, however, one other key thing that we, we have uh, noticed that is very much important is that it is important to have a one key source of alert which uh, minimizes um, incorrect or uh, fake alerts so so that people are able to act as uh, information is coming from a particular credible source because that often exacerbates the problem when there are different mouthpieces that are issuing alerts and you find that certain alerts are fake and then 
find that people are not acting or they're acting and after acting they say you lied to us we you said this and we, we acted like this so on and so forth so essentially generally in south africa three days prior alerts are issued and then we can we do analysis uh, with our own flood risk and then uh, to identify potential uh, flooding areas and also it must be from one single mouthpiece that is credible that uh, can be bet um, yeah thank you mm. i think i answered All the right. question Thank you so much for the detailed answer. Now for the final question is about floods. We know that yes. in South Africa, you know, droughts and floods are two of the most extreme climate changes challenges that you face in your country. So this question yes. is about the flood lines. Can remote yes. sensing be used to determine the flood lines within the municipality area? For example, the flood route line from the river towards the developed area. Okay, um, thanks for the question again. Um, I, I will have first have to provide a distinction. A flood line is a legislated product that uh, particular steps have to be followed uh, in depth for it to be produced uh, credibly. What we produce, we produce what we call a flood risk, which uh, does not follow the steps uh, that are legislated for creating a flood line, but the results are similar. So with the flood risk, that's what we generate from earth observation data. Uh, we use um, DEMs, digital elevation uh, models to uh, and hydrological softwares to model the flow of water uh, within rivers from areas of higher elevation to areas of lower elevation. So it provides us that ability to identify the areas that uh, were, I mean, that are at risk of flooding. But how it's generated, it's generated different from the processes of generating a flood line. I just needed to, to specify uh, that so that uh, people can understand this. These are two different processes, even though they yield a similar result. Right. Thank you so much, and I hope your answer is able to, um, you know, satisfy the 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 inquis our inquisitive um, audience over here. All right. Now. Um, we have come to the end of our morning session. A very big thank you to all our trainers from Sensor for the wonderful presentations. And of course, thank you to all our online audience for your participation. We hope that you have benefited from this training this morning. And if you are interested to learn more about the use of QGIS for decision making in the municipality area, do join us at 1 p.m. Central European Summer Time for the hands-on practical session. If you have not done so, we would encourage you to download the software prior to the start of the session to fully benefit from the hands on training. The link is provided in the chat. So now without further ado, thank you again uh, to everyone for your participation and we will resume again at 1 p.m. Thank you and see you again. <laughs>